work, my boots on and lace them up. A hard work. So, uh, personalized medicine. So, uh, basic definition, I'm going to try my best to go back and forth between these screens, but that's going to be awfully hard, so, so bear with me if you're on the far side. Um, personalized medicine, a simple definition is to tailor medical treatment to individual traits or characteristics of each patient and their needs. And, and so you may be thinking to yourself, well, you know, gosh, hopefully they're already kind of doing that, and they have been all along, and, and certainly to some extent they are. But I think what we're talking about now when we talk about personalized medicine is really more at the molecular level, uh, a molecular definition of personalized medicine. And so we'll talk about, no, not going to happen. All right. So we'll talk about what that means. And so I'm a cancer researcher. And so my examples tonight are mostly going to come from the cancer world. And so this, this slide kind of demonstrates uh, an idea of what we mean by personalized medicine at the molecular level. And so if we start with a group of, of colon cancer patients here, uh, the current, the current regimen in the clinic is to give them whatever the, the therapy of, of the day is, the one that at least is in the most recent clinical trials is shown to be reasonably effective for colon cancer patients. And so you'll give that group of patients that therapy, and what you'll find is that for a subset of those patients, they'll respond quite well to the therapy. You know, their survival will be prolonged, the disease will be halted in its tracks, and, and, and it should work quite well. Um, <laughs> But then you've got another group where nothing really happens at all. And so their disease continues to progress and the therapy really did nothing for them. And then you might even have a third group where actually the opposite is happening and they actually are having adverse effects to this therapy and it's making things worse. And so, you know, that's sort of the current practice. And, and what you'd like to be able to do is identify some type of molecular feature of these patients, what we call a molecular biomarker of these patients that helps you identify ahead of time who might be the patients that will respond to the particular therapy and who are the ones that won't respond. And so therefore you would give that therapy to those that you would predict would respond. And obviously you wouldn't then bother with those that you would imagine it won't respond to and save them that aggravation as well as the considerable expense of going through that therapy. And so that's kind of what, it, that's what personalized medicine means at the molecular level. And, and I'll give you an example because that, some of that is happening already. And so, um, and so this is a, a study from the mid-2000s. And this is in the New England Journal of Medicine. And so this was treating a group of colon cancer patients with, with a new drug at the time called cetuximab. And I'll talk about what cetuximab is in just a minute. And so they treated these patients with this experimental uh, new drug. And they found that, that a lot of the patients did quite well. Uh, it really improved what we call their progression-free survival, which means they were able to survive without the disease uh, going any further, without the disease getting any worse. And so they saw some good results. They saw good results in about half of the patients, okay? And so let's talk about what cetuximab is and, and what's going on here. And so this is a science boot camp, and so the fun's over. It's time to start doing some science. So we're going to do a little molecular biology here. And we'll try to go slow, but please stop me at any point during this talk if you'd like me to go over something or if you have a question. So when, when, a, when a cells in our body want to grow and they want to divide, um, it's a very communal decision. Cells are good. They consult with their neighbors before they make any decision like that. And the way that they consult with their neighbors is cells send back and forth these small molecules. And so that's represented by these yellow spheres here at the top. And in our, in our case here, it's, it's a molecule called TGF-alpha. And so cells trade back and forth these small molecules to communicate with one another. And at the surface of the cell, which is what this is here, this is the outer membrane of our cell, they have these proteins in there called receptors. And these receptors basically stick out like antennae. And they grab these small molecules, OK? And it turns the signal on, and, and for our example here, this receptor is a protein called the EGF receptor, or EGFR. And when this protein binds to these small molecules, it gets turned on, and it sends this signal. It sends this signal through a series of other proteins in the cell that kind of pass this signal along in a chain. Okay, and, and eventually that signal gets taken into the nucleus of the cell, and in the nucleus of the cell is where all of our genes are, and ultimately this leads to genes being turned on in the nucleus that promote cell growth. 
Okay, and so that's part of this decision about whether a cell is going to grow or not. It absolutely has to get these signals from its neighbors that it's okay to do so. Okay, so that's a normal cell. A cancer cell, on the other hand, is quite selfish. And so a cancer cell wants to grow, 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 regardless of what the neighbors think about it, okay? And there's a lot of ways that cancer cells come up with to get around this issue. And one of the things that they do, and we see this in colon cancer certainly, is they make a lot of these receptors. So they put a lot of these receptors on the surface. So even if there's only a little bit of that signal out there, it's going to grab onto them and it's going to promote cell growth, okay? And so the idea then that the researchers came up with is, well, cetuximab is a protein, this drug, oops, keep forgetting, I gotta hit that. Cetuximab is a protein that binds to these receptors at the same place that the small molecules would and effectively competes out the small molecules. It inhibits the binding of these small molecules so that you can turn this pathway off, okay? So that's the way it works. So the question then is, well, why did this only work in half of these patients? And so this next, this group followed up their study on the same patient population that they looked at originally, and they had a hypothesis that maybe there's another mutation that, uh, that occurs in some of these cancers that explains why it doesn't respond. And so their hypothesis was that some of these patients might have mutations in a gene called RAS. So if we go back to our, our, our uh, pathway here, this is RAS right here in red at the top. So RAS is one of those signaling molecules in that chain, that communication chain. And so the mutations that they're looking for is a very particular type of mutation that's, that's often referred to as an oncogenic mutation or an activating mutation. And so what that means is that this RAS protein is in a state where it's always on. It's always signaling whether there's something coming from up here or not, it's always signaling because of that mutation. And so it's always pushing this cell growth. And so therefore, as you can imagine, it doesn't matter if we try to block this receptor upstream of it because it's not taking its orders from that receptor anyway. So that might explain why this drug is not having any effect in patients with RAS mutations. And in fact, we already know that RAS mutations are quite common in cancers. These oncogenic mutations are, are quite common in about half of colon cancers have RAS mutations. So that was the hypothesis and so they did the study and, and so they basically took tumor samples from these patients that they had previously analyzed and they uh, did a molecular test to look for the RAS mutation. And so these were the patients that had normal RAS, so the RAS behaved as it should normally. And you can see from this um, that the ones that received the drug did much better than the ones that didn't, okay? So it worked in those patients. But on the other side uh, are the, the patients where their tumor did have one of these oncogenic mutations. And now you can see at this point, those with the drug and those without the drug did exactly the same. There was no benefit to the drug. And so what, we, what they have uncovered is a molecular biomarker for the efficacy of this drug, how well this drug might work. So the idea now going forward is you should be able to test colon cancer patients uh, and test their tumor to see if they have a rash mutation. And if they do, then you wouldn't bother giving them this drug, which is an extremely expensive drug. Um, so, and if they, if they don't, uh, and they have the overexpression or the, the increased levels of that EGF receptor, then, then you would give it to them and they probably would respond quite well. So this is an idea of personalized medicine at the molecular level and what it could be doing going forward. And so for the first time this evening, I'm gonna hop up on my soapbox and I'm going to, to tell you that the reason that this was possible is because of people like Channing Durr, who, who I borrowed this slide from, and many like him, that have spent decades understanding at the basic molecular level how cells grow and the proteins that regulate that and working out this entire pathway and who the players are and how that all works. And they did this research at the time not really thinking about how it would cure cancer or how it might lead to drug discovery. They just did it to acquire that basic knowledge of how the cells work. And, you know, imagining that, well, you know, how cells grow is something that's important for us to know. And at some point, somebody may use this information directly for a clinical treatment, whether it's us or another group. But the point is we need to understand how it works. And, and as we can see, a perfect example of how that works led to a, an actual clinical uh, use 
um, which, which we see over and over and over again in, in research. Okay, so now, so that's the idea of molecular personalized medicine. Now the thing that I'm sure a lot of you have heard a, a lot about more recently is this idea of using genomics, our personal genome for personalized medicine. And so this, this concept that um, you know, our genes will tell a story and we'll be able to use that information uh, for disease diagnosis and for disease prevention going forward to where we can now go uh, from, from a medical treatment where we're treating symptoms of a disease to one that's a little bit more futuristic, right, where we can basically scan the patient and figure out everything that's wrong with them and everything that's ever going to be wrong with them going forward, okay? So this idea of, of our genes, oops, I lost, there we are, of our genes being important for medicine is not a new one, right, by any means. I mean, this, as this is a, a time cover talking about sort of the similar idea from basically right after I was born. So it's not a, it's not a, a, a brand new idea. But what's different now, of course, is that we are finally at the doorstep of this being a reality. And, and so the, the two magazine covers that really matter for this story are these two. And so this is the copy of Science and Nature from February of 2001 that reported the first sequencing of the human genome. And so um, this is the possibility that now, or, or this is the, the event that now makes what we're going to be talking about here a, a real possibility going forward. And so this idea of using uh, what we call whole genome sequencing as a diagnostic tool is, is already becoming a reality, at least in the research setting. And so this is just a few of the papers that I pulled off, but there's several already that are out there. Um, where this idea of using genome sequencing of patients in disease diagnosis is a reality. And so this is just one I pulled off where they're using it to diagnose cancer. Um, others where groups are starting to use this in both prenatal and neonatal screening. And so this is happening. And of course, one of the probably the most um, exciting and inspirational stories and one of the first stories of this success uh, was a study from the University of Wisconsin. And this is a story of, of a, a small child who um, was suffering from a really unusual, a very severe inflammatory bowel disease at a very young age, like a year old. And, and it was terrible from, from the description. He wasn't gaining weight. He was uh, having terrible symptoms, um, going in and out of surgeries to try to correct this. He wasn't responding to any therapies. And, and the doctors didn't know what exactly was wrong with this patient. And so, you know, according to the study authors, this, this child was going to die if they didn't figure something out. So he was a candidate for this research at the University of Wisconsin to use whole genome sequencing for diagnosis. And so what they did is they, they, they sequenced his genome. And the idea is that you're going to look for genetic changes in this boy's genome compared to what would you know, consider to be sort of the normal reference genome and hopefully find some DNA sequence change that explained this boy's condition. And, and that's, you know, that's, that's a hard thing to do. That's, that's a bit of a long shot because if you take any two of us in this room and you sequenced our genomes, we are all going to have hundreds if not thousands of differences at the, at the sequence level between one another. And so to be able to find those sequence changes that actually direct some phenotype or physical difference between us, such as disease, is, is difficult. Um, now, fortunately, this, is a, this story has a happy ending. These researchers were lucky. They found a particular mutation in a gene called XIAP. And this gene, again, because of work of, of a lot of basic scientists before that, uh, was known to be involved in the decisions that, uh, of life or death in cells. And also, recently, just before they did this, it had been discovered that this gene also played an important role in regulating the immune response to, uh, to pathogens. And so, they found the mutation in this gene, they knew this basic knowledge of what this gene did, and they did some studies to show that the mutation that this boy had in this gene indeed affected the immune system. And so they were able to diagnose that this boy had an immune deficiency disease. Uh, and so with that information, uh, they were now able to go forward and do a bone marrow transplant where you could take a healthy donor and essentially reconstitute his immune system. And within a matter of two months, from doing that. His symptoms were dramatically improved. 
And the lead author, Liz Worthy, was here in Connecticut about a year and a half ago giving a talk on this story and said at this point the boy is now seven, he's in school, he's doing quite well. The GI symptoms are almost gone. So it's, it's a real success story. But you know, it's, 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 it's certainly hope for optimism, but it's not going to be this easy. Um, and not that this was easy, but I mean, it's, it's going to be met with many challenges. So the reason that, that I keep forgetting about that, I should just set that down. The reason that um, this is starting to become a reality is, is demonstrated on this slide. So this is a slide that illustrates the costs of sequencing the human genome. And so if we look back here in 2001, this is when that first genome was, was reported. The cost for that project was over $100 million. So it was not a trivial task by any means. But what you can see from this is that the, the cost for sequencing someone's genome has plummeted in the decade since, to the point where probably in the next year or so, it'll be under $1,000 to sequence someone's genome. And so that starts to put it in the realm where we could begin to use it clinically, not just in the research world, but actually uh, out in the communities as well. And so now we have this possibility to start sequencing the genome uh, as a diagnostic tool. And the idea is that um, this cost will probably continue to drop with improved technologies to where it can become even more common. Yes? Something I just want to interject from Absolutely. Our, our DNA sequencing guys at, at U of M. Mm -hmm. This will have some resonance, I think, for the librarians. Um, compared to computing capacity, especially in memory storage, it's now cheaper to resequence somebody's genome than to keep the information once you've done it once. <laughs> think about that for a second. Yeah. Well, that's, it's a, it, I'm, I'm glad you pointed that out because it's, it's actually a nice lead-in to the next slide. <laughs> Technology. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm going to go back. Yes, good question, good question. So what happened around here is, is, is a, a technological leap. And so uh, a, a, a technology that's referred to as next generation sequencing became a widespread practice. And so what this does is to, it basically puts sequencing on a chip. And so what it does is it allows you, instead of sort of sequencing one piece of DNA at a time, you can do thousands of chains at a time in one reaction. And so it speeds up the reaction tremendously uh, while, while reducing the costs, obviously, dramatically. And so that technology really took over the sequencing world uh, at around the, the middle of the last decade. And that explains the drop. Yep. OK. Correct. Competition for um, purchasing these big machines, so that tends to push the edges of innovation as well. And paying tax to babysit them. I know someone who does that job. It's yes. Thankless. Yes. <laughs> well, okay, exactly. So, so the issue is that so that's step one of this process, though. So this is what we're talking about when I say this is not going to be easy. We have this one success story, and it's a great story, but but the challenges ahead of us are immense. And so this sort of illustrates some of that. So what we've been talking about in the last slide with the cost of generating the sequence information, that's step one. And we're getting better and cheaper at that. But now what you're left with, as your uh, partner here alluded to, is that um, what we basically have is a bunch of data, right? We have all this data. And the next steps become a huge challenge, which is you need to take all that data, you need to assemble it all, you need to make sense of it all, you need to basically turn it back into an information that a biologist can look at and say, okay, that's the gene that's mutated. And so that's, that's a huge challenge still, and it's going to take uh, continued improvements in, in hardware and software technology, and it's going to particularly take people, people that are really trained to go back and forth between the information technology world and the biology world. And so this is a job if you have children that are in high school or thinking about going to college, boy, this is an area that uh, if they have any interest in biology and computers, there's, there's a huge future there because that, these people are, are, you know, they're extremely valuable right now, the ones that can go back between both worlds. And so this is a big hurdle um, in the research world right now. But to me, I, I still think even that's not the biggest challenge. We're going to solve that problem and we're going to continue to get better with that as, as we've seen even in the short you know, few years since sequencing has become so readily available for research institutions. Um, the challenge, of course, is still lies with the, the next step and that's this medical interpretation step. And so what I mean by that is we, now we know, okay, there's a mutation in these 100 genes, which mutation is actually uh, irrelevant to disease, if any. And that's, that's the part that's going to be tough. And so again, that's the part where the, the decades, over half a century of basic biological research and basic biomedical research that's gone on in this country is, is so important 
And, and the continuing of that is going to be essential for any of this to ever reach its full fruition. And so we need to know what these genes do. We need to know how they behave. We need to know, we need to be able to look at a particular mutation that comes back from the sequencing result and say, yeah, we think it's going to disrupt this function of this gene and therefore be important for disease. And we're not going to be able to do that if we don't continue to support basic research in this country. And so a lot that you hear about when it comes to biomedical research this year, another buzzword you've probably heard, is something called translational research. Translational research, everybody wants to, everyone wants us to stop doing what we're doing and start curing disease in the laboratory. And, and of course, we'd all love to be doing that, but no one can do translational research if we're not doing the basic biomedical research. In fact, it's more important that we're doing the basic biomedical research because that's, that's where we can make real progress. And then the translational research just feeds right off of that. And so you can't push, you know, obviously supporting translational and clinical research is important, but if we, if we push the research spectrum in this country fully in that direction, then things are going to slow down dramatically, if not come to a halt. And so again, like I said, that's the one message I hope I leave you with tonight, uh, is how important that this basic research is going to be and continue to be um, for this to, to, to go forward. And then the idea is you can take that knowledge and now you can use that information, what you know about the particular gene that's mutated, f to des develop new drugs, to develop new uh, diagnostic tests and new screening approaches uh, for disease. Okay, so for the last uh, 15 or so minutes, I'm going to talk about um, some examples of some of the things that are going on uh, at UConn, at the Health Center, um, and give you just a couple more stories of personalized medicine that are, hap that are either happening now or, or, or will be happening soon. Of course, absolutely. So, yeah. Um, what about methylation therapy? So you've got mm -hmm. the genetics that will take care of things in the environmental impact on the disease. Yeah. And I feel like that combination adds another level of complexity to the It absolutely does, and it adds another level of complexity to this talk. If you want me to get into all that, I'm <laughs> certainly happy to do it. <laughs> so, so, so what she's alluding to is that, um, so what we're talking about with, with the sequencing is the, is the code, right, the, the DNA code of, of a particular gene. But as I alluded to in the, in the earlier slide, what's important is not only that code, which of course instructs the protein that is made, but whether or not that gene is even being turned on to make that protein, right, or how much the gene is being turned on to make that protein. And there's a whole other level of regulation in how that decision is made. And so one of the things that happens is there's a particular modification to DNA called methylation. And it's a little chemical group that gets stuck on to different DNA bases. And one of the things that methylation does is it helps regulate whether a gene is turned on or off. And so if you look in our cells, that pattern of methylation is, is very important for telling one cell that it's a skin cell and one cell that it's, it's a colon cell. Because you know, the DNA code is the same in all of our cells, right? But it's, it's which genes are on, which genes are off, how much they're on and off at different times. That's what tells the cell what it is. And, and a lot of that is regulated by, by methylation, this, this modification to DNA. And, and disease, cancer is a great example, can often have defects in, in these methylation patterns. And so genes that should be on are, are off and vice versa. And so understanding changes in methylation uh, and these modifications with DNA is another important aspect to understanding disease at the molecular level. Yeah. Okay. Another question? Yeah. I'm sorry. Does it make it even more complex when you have epigenetic factors as well than, um, that come into play with this? Absolutely, right? So, so I, I mean, so methylation, what I was talking about, is, is an example of epigenetics, right? right? And so there are a number of, of um, God, you know, if I was prepared, I would have had a whole other set of slides. We could have gone into this. I, you know, I wasn't quite sure the, the sophistication of this audience, but it's quite high, so that's great. Yeah, I, no, this is wonderful. This is good. So, um, right, so, so, all right, let's, let's unpeel another layer. So, so um, the methylation is one of the modifications. There are also other proteins that are bound to DNA, and so these proteins are called histones. And so these proteins sort of determine, you can imagine the DNA, we have uh, DNA, we have six billion base pairs in a given cell, and it could run on for miles if you were to stretch it out end to end, and it's got to fit into a microscopic cell, okay? And so what happens is this stuff gets packed and wound up extremely tightly, and, and what regulates that are these proteins called histones. The DNA winds around these proteins, okay? So the histones have two important jobs. Um, 
or, or, or two sort of countervailing forces at play here. One is that it wants to pack this DNA up really tightly to protect it, to, to compact it and to protect it. But the second thing is that sometimes it has to kind of let go so that the DNA can be used, you know, for, for, for turning genes on and, and for things, other processes where DNA is used. And so the histones are also tightly regulated as to how tightly wound the DNA is around them. And so there are a lot of different chemical modifications to these histones that determine whether the DNA is tightly bound, which would be basically associated with DNA that's turned off. Or, or relaxed, in which case that's usually associated with DNA that's on. So genes that are actively being turned into protein, uh, into RNA and into protein, you guys know this so I don't have to dumb it down, um, are, are going to be uh, relaxed. And so these chemical modifications to these histone proteins sort of helps direct that and it kind of goes hand in hand with the methylation that we talked about. And so this is, an, this is an example of what's called epigenetics. And so it's not a change in the DNA sequence, it's not a change in your genetics. But it still is very important in regulating your physical characteristics because it dictates whether these genes are turned on or off. And so that's, a whole, that's, a, that's another level of regulation. And so, so you're right, we need to understand both. because. And one of the things that we're learning with cancer is that um, even though for, for, for the last couple of decades we've strongly considered cancer to be a genetic disease, which it certainly is, uh, that epigenetics is playing a more important role than we ever imagined in regulating you know, whether a cell is, is cancerous or not. And so those two things, they, yeah, they, they definitely go hand in hand. Mm -hmm. Okay? All right. So, okay, so a couple stories from, from UConn Health. And so the first story is um, from the head of our cancer center. This is Pramod Srivastava here on your left. And um, he uh, is an immunologist at the health center. And so he's uh, starting up a trial at the health center excuse me, where uh, they're uh, taking women with ovarian cancer. And so what they're going to do is they're going to do whole genome sequencing on these women. So they're going to take, say, a blood sample, and they're going to sequence the DNA from these women. But then they're also going to take uh, some of the tumor DNA, and they're going to sequence the, the genome from the tumor as well. And what they're going to look for then are all the different changes that have occurred in the tumor DNA from what would be the patient's normal DNA. And they will find thousands because tumors are very mutable. They have lots of uh, genetic changes in tumors. And some of those genetic changes, as we've discussed, are going to be very important for what makes a, a cancer cell a cancer. But most of them actually are, are not really that important for the cancer cell. But because the tumor goes through so much mutation, they happen and they kind of come along for the ride. We call them passenger mutations. Okay. Now, the nature of the mutation for this study is not that important. What this group is interested in are those mutations that are going to change the way that a particular gene's protein looks. Okay? So the mutations that occur in genes that make protein and change the way that the protein looks are what they're interested in. Because if the protein is slightly different, it's going to be recognized by the immune system a little bit differently. Okay? And so what they're going to do is they're going to find these changes in these patients and then they're going to go off a site and they're going to make a vaccine to that particular change. And then they're going to treat the patient with this personalized vaccine so that it will attack the cancer cells that are making this abnormal protein. So that's the idea. And so, so we've gone from this idea of, of this sort of another version of that slide I showed you earlier of personalized medicine where we're trying to find biomarkers to identify groups of patients that might respond to a particular drug. This particular study, is, as Dr. Srivastava likes to refer to it, is sort of the ultimate personalization because what they hope to be able to do is to be able to take information from each person's individual cancer and make a specific vaccine to that cancer and that cancer only. And so each person would have their own specific treatment. So that's the plan. And so they're, they're going through the, the approval process now and they, they hope to be starting this trial up very soon. So that's one story. The second story I'm going to tell you is, is from my own work, because, you know, of course, well, I wouldn't be here if I couldn't talk about my own stuff. Um, so, but what I'm going to tell you about, actually, is, is this idea of using genetics for personalized medicine is, is actually not really new. The one area where we've already been doing that for quite some time is, is in the area of hereditary disease and hereditary cancers. And so these are cancers where there's a genetic component that's passed through generations of families, okay? And so we study in my laboratory a disease called Lynch syndrome. And so Lynch syndrome is a um, hereditary disease in which patients 
uh, have a, an extremely increased risk of developing colorectal cancer at some point in their lifetime. Okay, and, and, the, and typically they develop the colon cancer at, at relatively speaking, a very young age. Um, now these patients, in addition to colon cancer, also are at a risk of developing other cancers. Uh, endometrial cancer, ovarian cancer in women are, are quite common in these patients. And so this, again, this is a, a I, I, I love telling the story about Lynch syndrome because it's another real great example to illustrate the importance of basic science. So Lynch syndrome actually unknowingly was first described in the early 20th century by, by this man here, uh, Aldred Worthen at the University of Michigan. And so uh, the way that this happened is Worthen uh, was having a conversation with this young seamstress who worked for him. And she was very upset and, and he went to talk to her to ask her what was wrong. And she said, well, um, you know, I, I know I'm going to die of stomach of the, uh, of cancer of the stomach or of the female organs because everybody in my family dies of stomach of the, uh, cancer of the stomach or the female organs. And, and this statement intrigued Worthen and, and being a good scientist, he followed up on that and he started collecting a bunch of information about this young woman's family and he created this family tree of this woman's family. And it dated back to this guy right here in the middle of this picture. And this, uh, this was a, a man who emigrated to Michigan from Germany in the 1830s. And he, sure enough, he had died when he was 60 years old from, from stomach or intestinal cancer. And if you look at his family tree, essentially, you can see is the, 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 the filled in circles and boxes represent uh, descendants of his over multiple generations who died of, of cancer of the intestine or of the uterus at, at quite young ages. And so this really struck Worthen and he went then to look at other patients in his, his patient population at the University of Michigan to see if he could identify other families that had these trends of, of cancer in them. And, and he kind of came to the conclusion that somewhere around 15 percent of his cancer patients probably had some type of family or genetic uh, trait to them that was responsible for their cancer. And so he published this work in 1913. And that work went largely uh, unnoticed for many years until the 1960s when another doctor in Nebraska, Henry Lynch, uh, had a very similar thing happen to him. He, it was known around campus that he had some interest in genetics and so he was brought in to consult on a patient who was um, an alcoholic and suffering from depression. And so we sat down with this man and he said, you know, What's the problem? And, and a very similar story. He said, well, I know I'm going to die of intestinal cancer because everybody in my family dies of intestinal cancer. So the same story. So Lynch followed up with this and, and collected information on his family and saw a very similar type of pattern to what, what Worthen had seen uh, almost 40 years earlier. And um, so Lynch went about then collecting information on other families to show this familial pattern of cancer and took all of that and submitted a grant to the NIH to try to make the claim that, that at least some percentage of cancers had a, a genetic cause to them and not just an environmental cause. And of course, as, as uh, is not unusual, even back then, his, his grant was rejected. But <laughs> <laughs> this did not deter him. And so Lynch spent the rest of his career basically building the case for this and collecting information on families around the world and, and finding colleagues and collaborators from around the world. And together they were able to convince the medical community that yes, indeed, uh, there's an aspect of cancer that's hereditary, that's, that's genetic uh, in cause. Um, and so that takes us to the 1980s. And now in the 1980s, once it was started to, to become accepted that, that some of these cancer diseases were indeed genetic, now the hunt was on to find the genes that were responsible for these diseases. And so this was an era in, in biomedical research of the great gene hunters. So big labs that would spend lots of money to try to find these disease genes. And boy, if you found one, you were, you were famous. And, and so, so the hunt was on. And so of course, Lynch syndrome was a big one. And, and so um, lots of powerful cancer labs were hunting furiously to find what the gene was that caused this. So an important breakthrough occurred in about 1991 when a few different groups reported a particular DNA anomaly that occurred in about 90% of the cancers from these patients. And so this particular DNA anomaly, they didn't really know what it meant. They just thought it was striking that it was such a frequent thing to occur in, these, in so many of these patients that it had to mean something, but they really had no idea what it meant. 
a, a, a group of yeast researchers, so basic biologists who just were studying processes in yeast, saw this report and said, well, we know what that is. <laughs> this is what happens in yeast when we knock out these DNA repair genes called mismatch repair. So these guys who were not cancer researchers at all jumped into this game and they found that sure enough humans have the same DNA repair genes in our genome and indeed Lynch syndrome patients have mutations in these genes. So these yeast biologists working in basic processes and yeast that we brew beer with uh, beat out all these high-powered cancer labs and uncovered the genes responsible for Lynch syndrome and really opened up a brand new world of, of cancer research. And so, so it's, a, it's a great example of, of the type of research that we were doing. We have no clue maybe today what the application is, but, but it's going to have an application. If we're studying basic processes of, of life and death in cells, it's going to be important. Uh, and it's something that we need to obviously continue to keep doing. So, so really quickly, let me just run through mismatch repair in one slide um, to, to, talk, to set up a little bit about what we do in my lab. Um, so when the cell makes that decision, obviously, to divide into two daughter cells, it needs to make a copy of all of its DNA. And so there's a protein machinery called the DNA polymerase machinery that makes an exact replica of all the DNA in our cells. And it does it quite quickly, quite efficiently, and, and, and pretty darn uh, accurately. But it's not perfect. And so it's going to make mistakes. Uh, about once every six million base pairs or so, it'll make a mistake, okay? But fortunately, we have this repair pathway called the DNA mismatch repair pathway. And its job is to kind of trail along behind and find those mistakes. And when it finds those mistakes, it'll remove that little bit of DNA uh, and let the polymerase come in and try to get it right the second time. Okay, so it's very important. As you can imagine now, in a Lynch syndrome patient, if you have a mutation that knocks out the function of one of these mismatch repair proteins, then you are going to have a bunch of these mistakes that are going to be uncorrected. And that's going to increase the number of mutations in a given cell. And if you start increasing mutations in cells, you increase the chance of cancer developing in that cell. And that seems to be what happens. So, for Lynch syndrome, determining whether there's a, a mutational change in one of these mismatch repair genes is, is really an essential part of the diagnosis. So we're not sequencing the whole genome with these patients yet, but we have been sequencing the mismatch repair genes in people that we think might have this disease. For, for several years now. And, and, we, and that information is, is essential to the physician to make the diagnosis of Lynch syndrome. And the diagnosis is important because it's gonna, one, it's gonna affect how you manage that patient, okay? But secondly, as we've talked about, this is a hereditary disease. And so if they've got the mutation, then there's a good chance someone else in their family might have it as well, and particularly their children. And so it's an important, uh, it's an important distinction to make for that reason as well. The problem, however, as, as I alluded to earlier, is that just because you see a, a sequence change, even if it's in a gene that you know is somehow involved in disease, that sequence change doesn't necessarily mean that the protein is disrupted, okay? So there are some mutations you can look at them and you can say, yeah, that clearly messes up a protein and this person has got the disease. But there's a subset of mutations where you look at it and you're like, well, it could. But, you know, it's only changing one little part of the protein that may not be that big of a deal. Because we have, as we talked about, there are differences that, that cause little tiny changes in proteins between you and me, and that's not really going to change that much. It's certainly not going to give one of us a disease. So the question is, does this, does this particular change that we identified in this patient with cancer really cause disease? And so we refer to those as, as variants, sequence variants of uncertain significance. And, and it's a... It's a a big clinical problem. It, it's, it's, a, it's a variant, a sequence variant that's been identified, but, but its implications for, for cancer risk are not immediately obvious to the clinician. And so this causes a big problem because the clinician now doesn't really have their definitive diagnosis that they were looking for when they ordered the sequencing test. And, and you continue to have this anxiety now in the patient who's dealing with their own cancer, but also wants to know if it's something even bigger than, than themselves. Because if this is a person, let's say, that's coming in in their mid-50s with this disease, and they've got a couple kids in their 20s, the question is, do you sequence these children? Right? And if you do, and they have this mutation, does it really matter? Are they really at risk of developing cancer? Because if they are, they're getting colonoscopies every year for the rest of their life. Or they're having surgery. So it's not, you know, it's, it's, it's not a trivial decision. 
Okay, and, and this just basically uh, is, is to show that, you know, it's, it's a fairly significant problem, anywhere from a quarter to a half of mutations identified uh, in suspected patients are of this uncertain variety. So my laboratory has been working over the years with, with clinicians and, and scientists from really around the world. The one nice thing about Lynch is that it's a really strong community, and so there's a whole global community uh, that is studying Lynch and, and patients, as you can imagine, that are, that are motivated to help out. And um, we're basically, there's a group of us that are trying to answer the specific question of does a, does a given sequence change that we identify in a patient really cause this disease? Is it really responsible for the cancer that the patient has? And there's a, a, a few different things. What, we, what we're essentially trying to do is kind of like a, 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 for a trial in front of a court, we're trying to build evidence for a particular sequence change that yes, it, it causes disease or no, it doesn't. So some of the questions that we'll ask is, does the particular variant occur in all the different family members that have a cancer? So, so one of the things that you would suspect is that there are going to be multiple members of a given family that have cancer, if it's a Lynch syndrome family. And do each of those, those uh, cancer patients have this, this sequence variant, this, this sequence change? Um, the second thing is, the flip side of that, is if we were to just randomly take 1,000 healthy people off the street that don't have Lynch syndrome, that don't have colon cancer, um, you would expect that, that they shouldn't have this change, or, or maybe a very, very small percentage, less than 1%, would have this change. Okay? So those are sort of the genetic questions that can be asked. The other more clinical question is, well, the tumor that this patient has might have certain features that are kind of in common with other Lynch syndrome patients. There are certain you know, features of the cancer itself that they might share. And then the fourth thing, this is where my lab comes in, is, you know, again, Drawing on what have now been two decades of work on the fundamental process of mismatch repair, does this sequence variant actually change the function of the protein? And so we can do that in the laboratory. We've designed functional tests to study these variants. And so we have uh, test tube-based tests where we can essentially recreate the protein by itself in the laboratory and put it in the test tube and sort of analyze its function. We know an awful lot from the basic research that we and others have done over 20 years to know what this protein is supposed to do. So now if we use the, the variant version of that protein, can it perform those functions as well or not? And, and, and similarly, we can do this in, in human cells as well. We can take cells and we can put this, this uh, variant gene into cells and we can ask what happens to the cells. And so in the laboratory, we can create tests to determine whether or not the variant truly disrupts the expected function of the mismatch repair pathway. And if we put that evidence together with the other evidence that the, cl the clinicians and the human geneticists are, are getting from the patients, we can start to build a case on a case-by-case -case variant uh, basis for these sequence variants as to whether they cause disease. Okay. So, uh, the last thing really quickly that I'll just touch on, um, Evelyn mentioned at the beginning, one of the other big changes that's happening uh, here in Connecticut is the Jackson Laboratory for Genomic Medicine is, is, uh, has moved to the Farmington campus. Um, they have a beautiful new building that's going up that should be done by the end of the summer and they're starting to recruit. We have several of their researchers that are already on the ground. Uh, I actually have a grant application in with one of them that hopefully we'll heard about soon. Um, so, so they're on the ground already. Uh, but the other thing that, that's happening in, in, in partnership with the Jackson Labs uh, at both here at the UConn campus here in stores as well as out in Farmington is, is the creation of this Institute for Systems Genomics. And um, while I'm by no means a spokesperson for either of these ventures, uh, I did get a couple bullet points from Dr. Lalonde, the director. And essentially the idea of, of this institute is to partner with the, the UConn campuses as well as Jackson Labs to basically go forward in, in research uh, and, and training for students and clinicians in genomics and personalized medicine. So that is the goal going forward to sort of uh, make it kind of break down the barriers between these different groups and, and sort of have a, a centralized organization for this type of research to occur at, at all three of the different campuses. Uh, but, but you know, the, the basic idea is what we've been talking about uh, throughout this evening's talk, which is to be able to use information about individuals' genes uh, for, for diagnosis, for treatment, and ultimately the plan is to be able to collaborate with pharmaceutical companies and other researchers to come up with, with new tests and new drugs and to be able to do that important preclinical research uh, for, for these uh, new treatments. 
So that's, that's what's you know, hopefully coming here in Connecticut uh, very soon. And so you know, I'll just close um, by basically sort of reiterating the message before that, that you know, we are right on the precipice of something very exciting. And it's, it's already happening. Um, it's, it, right now, it's, it's still kind of restricted to the research world because of all the issues that we've talked about tonight. But as those barriers start coming down, it will start to spread and eventually find its way into, into the community health as well. Um, but again, you know, I, I'll just reiterate that if we don't know the basic process, and so one of the things that came out of the human genome sequence is, you know, we know all the genes now, but, but we, don't, we only know a fraction of what they do, right? Uh, and even the ones that we've been studying for 20 years, obviously we fill the literature with hundreds of papers every year, as I'm sure you guys are well aware of, uh, on what these genes do. Uh, so we're constantly learning more information, and, and every day that new information gets us one step closer to using it for personalized medicine. And so, so you know, hopefully you guys uh, understand that. I'm sure you do and can continue to be advocates for, for basic research um, because it's so important for, for all that we're doing. So thank you very much for your time. I've, I've had fun being a hero with this evening, and I'm certainly happy to have a discussion until they kick us out. <laughs> Any questions? Any kind of, yeah. So, um, some of the, the science is all is fascinating stuff and, and very hopeful and, and exciting and all that. But yeah, we focus on the good news tonight. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, whenever I hear the talk, and I, and I work at UMass in medical. Oh, so great. Yeah, I have yeah, colleagues up there. Certainly. Lots of similar and different things going on. Yeah. But, um, I just can't, from the applied part, from the healthcare system, I can ever wrap my head around how this will ever be scalable for what for yeah. for healthcare. Yeah. And, and so we, we have just so many broken parts in me and that and that is right. just not where you are. Yeah, right. right just right. from your perspective as a scientist to doing this research. <laughs> well, I can't. I mean, I can't comment necessarily on all the issues with healthcare and, and, and everything associated with that. But, but what I can kind of, what I can tell you is that, as I mentioned, some of this is already happening. And not just the experimental stuff that I touched on tonight. But, but you know, Lynch syndrome, you know, I tell that story because it's what I do. But it's also a great example of how we've already been doing it. So, you know, what you find with insurance companies is that if you can convince them that a particular molecular test is really going to save them money, they will pay for it. And so one of the things that genetic counselors do when they're consulting patients that they think have Lynch, they, they, they get the family information from the patient. If they can find just enough information to suggest that it's even remotely possible, they can convince the insurance companies to pay for those sequencing tests. And so they will. And, and, and so, you know, it is happening already. Now, obviously, what we're talking about is something much grander. But, you know, again, it's, it's, it's going to come down to, obviously, the costs need to continue to drop, which they are. As we saw from that figure, you know, they're dropping at, at an incredibly rapid rate. And, and, and there's no reason, from what we know, that we'll expect that to slow down. And so I think, you know, I think people in that community fully expect that the costs are going to get down to a level where that's not an issue, the sequencing costs. Uh, you know, certainly within the next decade, and those predictions are probably being plenty cautious because it'll probably happen faster. So I don't think people are so much worried about that aspect of it. Um, and, and I believe, just based on the, the track record that we've seen, that, that insurance companies will, you know, they will support things that are going to save them money in the long run. And so if you don't have to, to spend, you know, $20,000 a month on a drug because you've got a molecular test that tells you it's not going to work, Insurance companies are going to pay the 200 bucks for that test to be done, you know? So, so, I mean, I think, you know, optimistically, I think as long as we continue to, to advance our knowledge and, and, and the costs continue to drop, then, you know, I think there will be plenty of incentive for, for this to go forward. Yeah? Are you, are you going to expect any problems between evidence-based medicine and personalized medicine? Because evidence-based medicine seems to think that one size fits all. Yeah, well, um, <laughs> the problem is the evidence is not that, right? So, um, I, I mean, no, I, th I think, listen, the, the, the driver there is, is going to be, 
and this might be one of the roadblocks, is, is going to be in the drug development, right? Because what the drug companies want is a one-size-fits-all drug, because then everyone buys it and they make all the money. And that's, that's been a huge problem. And, and so that is a potential limitation to that. And, and, you know, again, the example I gave you of the individual treatment, as wonderful as that sounds, you know, there is this market force that that may run up against that conceptually that sounds great, but, but you know, will, will there be a company? Maybe if the company's in charge of making all the vaccines, that actually isn't such a bad deal for them. Um, but uh, that, to me, w could be the, the stumbling block, or maybe not the stumbling block, but something that's going to have to be dealt with is, is this sort of a different model for the drug companies and how they approach Well, again, you know, I think what you'd like to think is that if, if people find more efficient ways of doing things, that, that the bureaucracies will take care of themselves. I mean, they'll flow downhill, you'd like to think. Um, but that's the challenge, is, is demonstrating that it indeed is more efficient in the long run to go this route. Yeah. I don't want to be an apologist for evidence-based medicine, but really, if there's evidence that the personalized medicine works, that's, I mean, the, the, one of the big challenges in, in the process of evidence-based medicine is there's not sufficient evidence, and then applying it to the patient. These patients, when, when clinical trials are done, typically they pick patients from a fairly narrow a category yeah. where they exclude any comorbidities. They exclude all sorts of things. And so when a, so when a, a clinician is looking at these trials, they say, but my patient's not like that. They have comorbidities. That's right. They have, and so there's a mismatch already between the evidence and the application. And that's, I, mean, I think that's pretty clear to anybody who's a, who's a practitioner of evidence-based medicine is that, yeah. is that sufficient evidence to really apply evidence to their patients, is there's a huge gap. Yeah. So as I said, I, 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 I complain about evidence-based medicine, but I think I think that's well, I think the other thing well that, that changed, I mean, the one thing that I always have to remind myself, because, you know, I've, I've been in an academic medical center for, you know, the last 20, 25 years, and so I'm just sort of, that's, I'm just, I, I think everybody thinks the way that we think, and it's not true, right? So most physicians are not at academic medical centers, and so sort of what we talk about and think about in the types of, of, of treatments and studies that are being done in an academic medical center are obviously very different than what's going on out in the community. And, and but the one thing that I would say, you know, that is changing hopefully going forward is that the, the, the doctors of tomorrow, those medical students are being trained in the academic medical centers and so they are exposed to this. And so, you know, I think there's, well, they, they are exposed to it. Whether it sinks in or not is another question. Um, <laughs> having taught some medical courses. Um, but, you know, the idea is that this is going to just become more and more of the, of the vernacular for, for physicians. Right now it may still be kind of restricted to those that are in places where it's happening, which is often the academic medical centers. Um, but it, 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 you know, it will start to slowly infiltrate out, and particularly as, as the, the younger physicians start to step up, who've actually ha had training in this. I mean, you know, the, the physicians now are obviously having, are, are being trained, at least to some extent in this. Um, obviously not, as, not uh, extensively, but, um, but you know, they are going through this, and it won't be as foreign to them when they're out there uh, practicing. Mm -hmm. You mentioned that Yeah. How do you determine if a family member is going to get lynched? Oh, if they don't check it. Well, so that's, you don't, right? So that's the thing. I mean, that's, it's, it's basically, so right now the way that it works, so if we just focus on colon cancer, I mean, the one, one of the, the things about colon cancer is that we've come, you know, we've come a long way with colon cancer and being able to screen for the disease. Obviously, the colonoscopy has been extremely important. Um, there are guidelines. Everyone in this room who's 50 or older should have had a colonoscopy by now. If not, you know, I can give you a number. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there, there are guidelines. And so, for example, if, if you have a family member that has had colon cancer, uh, particularly if it's a first-degree relative, then your first colonoscopy should occur 10 years prior to the age in which they were diagnosed. And so, so even, you know, even if you don't have a, a, you know, a documented case of Lynch, if, if your mom or dad, for example, had colon cancer when they were 50, then, then you should be in there at the age of 40 anyway for your first screening. 
So what the, what the genetics obviously does is it now, it, it identifies those patients who are at a, at a much higher risk. So there's cancer in families, and it doesn't necessarily mean they have Lynch, right? So you may have relatives, you may even have multiple relatives in your family that have, that have had cancer, and we'll, again, we'll stick with colon cancer as an example. But it doesn't mean that they have Lynch syndrome, all right? There are, there are, there are other familial, sort of, we call them sort of the familial cancers. The Lynch syndrome is an example of a hereditary cancer, where it's a clear-cut hereditary basis. We know what the genes are that are responsible for it. But then there's about maybe 20 to 30 percent of cancers in the population that are familial. And so what that means is that there is multiple cancers in the family, but maybe it's not uh, such a strong inheritance and maybe we don't exactly know what the genetic cause is. It may be something that where there is a gene we haven't found yet or maybe it's multiple genes or maybe it's not genetic at all and it's more environmental. Um, but there are obviously cancers, uh, there are families that have multiple cancers. And so Already you would be, if you have a family member with cancer, you would be considered to be at a greater risk. Now if you're a Lynch syndrome patient, that gets magnified even further. And so the importance of the molecular screen is to be able to distinguish between those that just have a familial cancer and are at, you know, maybe a two or three-fold increased risk versus those that have Lynch syndrome that now are going to have a, a much more dramatically increased risk. And again, as we talked about, with, with, with you know, a single cancer in your family, for example, you're advised to get your first colonoscopy at 10 years younger than the age you were diagnosed. If you have a confirmed case of Lynch in your family, uh, it is suggested that you undergo genetic testing. And if you carry the, the, the variant or the mutation, then you're starting colonoscopies in your 20s. And so it's, it's a pretty, it is still a dramatic difference in risk. And so that's the significance of the testing, of the genetic testing, if there's any suspicion. But having a single member in your, of your family that has cancer, that's not strong enough evidence to suspect Lynch, and so I, an insurance company probably wouldn't pay for genetic testing. Well, it depends. It, it, it's case by case sometimes. Some, the genetic counselors have gotten very good at arguing with insurance companies to get their patients, get their patients screened. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm a new medical librarian, and uh -huh. so in terms of like genetics and things like that, what are the conferences, journals, things that I should know to help you do your job better and make like groundbreaking decisions and oh, things boy. like that? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Evelyn should field this one. She's, she's the expert there. I mean, you know, it's, it's uh, it, the problem is, as Evelyn can tell you, is it's, it's a lot of them now. I mean, it's really exploded. Uh, and, 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 you know, if you are a cancer researcher like I am, um, the cancer journals are not enough because you need to, you need to, I mean, cancer, the one thing about cancer is that just about every process in the cell is affected in cancer, which means you kind of need to know everything, which means you need every major journal, you need every specialty journal. So, I mean, I, you know, to run down a list, I, you know, I, I peruse, you know, journals, uh, easily, you know, 50 journals fairly regularly, at least to kind of keep track of what's coming out in them. I mean, there are certainly specific, you know, 10 or so that are kind of go-to that I make sure that I check out. Um, so, so, I mean, to, to give you a list of journals, I don't know how you do it right now, but because it's, it's, it's fairly extensive. Um, you know, the conferences, if you're talking about cancer, um, you know, the major one is, is the American Association for Cancer Research. I mean, they have their annual meeting, and that's certainly a big one that, that both clinicians and scientists attend. The, um, the ASCO meetings for the clinicians, the clinical oncologists, is a big meeting. Uh, and then there are just specialty conferences. And again, it depends. You know, so for me, as a, as a basic scientist, I'm very much interested in, obviously, cancer and hereditary cancers. But I'm also just interested in the basic biochemistry of how this pathway works. So I'm going to specific meetings on, there are different, there are different meetings for DNA repair, you know, just the, the mechanisms of DNA repair. And so I'll go to those meetings and read their journals. And so it just, it starts to add up. <laughs> and it piles up pretty quickly. Can I ask a related, sort of related question? First. Do you, how did you build that list of the things oh. that you're following? Yeah. Was it actually, I'm doing a PubMed search for my gene pathway, and I'm following it regardless of which organism they're doing it in? Or is it, did it get built some other way? So the one thing that, that you accept as a scientist, because things have exploded, so it's much harder now than it was when I was training as a graduate student, because it's just exploded. Mm -hmm. And um, so what you accept, or you have to accept, is that, you know, I'm going to miss a lot, and I'm not going to know everything. And you just, you just let yourself go of that burden, you know, <laughs> right off the top. Um, it's a process, and so, you know, it's, uh, so I'll tell you, you know, obviously with 
the electronic resources has changed everything, obviously. I mean, that's, that's huge. I, you know, I hate to say it, Evelyn, I never come see you because <laughs> I don't have to. And so, um, you know, the electronic resource is huge. And, and so, um, you know, one of the easiest things, that, you know, just about every major journal that I need, their table of contents comes to my email, right? So that's essential. I mean, I, every day I'll get those emails. And there are different search services, even if I dig in a little deeper. So those services are essential mm -hmm. because that's, I, you know, I put in my key terms that I'm interested in and that information comes right to my desktop every morning. So that's one because that makes, that, that makes sure I'm not catching or that I can catch the big things mm -hmm. that come through. Um, but then it's, it's a matter of, I mean, we were talking about this earlier. For me personally, I still use PubMed because in, in my world, PubMed still covers everything I need it to cover. Um, so I'll, you know, I'll go on PubMed and, and, and you know, kind of like, <laughs> I, you know, people talk about the YouTube spiral where you kind of start down YouTube and you can't, you sort of take I mean, well, PubMed, PubMed's the same way, you know? You'll start down and you'll see one paper and then that'll take you off in another direction and then you'll follow the paper trail. And, and so, you know, they'll just, when I have the rare day, when I, when I have some time, I'll go off on one of those, those trails and try to catch up on a particular area. And, um, you know, as tough as grant writing is, one of the things about grant writing is sometimes it forces you to sit down and do that. So it's, it's not something where... Um, you know, the one thing I, I, I always find challenging is when I have a new student in the laboratory that's just starting into the field. <laughs> Boy, I just don't know where to tell him to begin, you know, because, <laughs> I mean, when I, well, and that's exactly what happens. And so I say, all right, here's four papers, and you take them, and you read the references in them as well. I mean, you know, you start, you start, you have to build your library, and that's what you have to do. And, and you know, for me, so I, um, when I was a graduate student, I worked on a gene called APC, which is actually uh, the gene responsible for another hereditary colon cancer disease called familial adenomatous polyposis. And I worked in the laboratory of the woman who discovered that gene. And she discovered it about a year or two before I joined. And so when I was starting out, there, weren't, there wasn't that much to learn. <laughs> I mean, there was only a few papers, and, and, and it wasn't, you know, this was the early 90s, so it wasn't that unusual that a lot of the cancer field was just kind of beginning then. So it wasn't that, you know, it, it was hard, but it wasn't as hard because you could kind of catch up with what has been done and then just stay current. And, and that's kind of the key is, you know, is staying current. Mm -hmm. For the students that are starting today, you know, they've got 25, 30 years, they have to go back. And so, you know, the, it's obviously it's impossible for them to do it, but you try to highlight the key points for them, and, and then that's the thing. You train them to build their library, because that's how, what you have to do. Where do you keep your papers, and how do you track all I use EndNote. Mm -hmm. I use EndNote. So I have, I have multiple EndNote libraries for different subjects, and, and, you know, and I, I spend the you know, 60 seconds it takes to download the paper and build the EndNote file for everyone, because I go back and I use it constantly. So it's worth for me to spend the time to do that. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Go through the peer review process, and um, this one particular faculty has started like a crowd sourcing site mm. in terms of peer review. Yeah. And how do you feel about that, uh, especially in the medical arena? It concerns me as a librarian, um, and so I was just wondering. Crowd sourcing, as in, as in just <laughs> regular people, or crowdsourcing as in scientists? Well, you, I'm not familiar with it. I'll, I'll right. be honest. So, so and, I, and I don't remember the, uh, the title of this thing, so you can Google it and yeah. on the Chronicle. What it is, I'm sorry. Peer check. Peer check. Oh, it's a close period. Yeah, it's a period. Yeah, there was another one. Yeah, but there was another one recently. Um, but anyhow, so this, this would be uh, people in the field, maybe outside of the field, mm -hmm. reviewing um, this journal uh, or this journal article posting it on this site. I see. So that the peer review process is quicker. Yeah. Um, but there are also other issues. Yeah, you know, I don't know. I, I, haven't, I haven't given any thought before, so I don't really know how I feel about it. I mean, it, it, it's, it is a huge issue. And um, it's hard to say whether it's an issue of, you know, sort of organization and administration of the journals, but more likely it's, it's just an issue with the reviewers themselves. I mean, as you can imagine, the problem that you run into is that there are 
you know, a handful of people that are particularly, you know, particularly uh, appropriate for reviewing a certain work just because of the level of expertise that's involved now. And these are busy people and, and you know, there's really, quite honestly, there's, other than just sort of the part of the community of scientists, there's really no incentive to, to be doing this, to be doing the peer review. And so, you know, it takes a lot of time to do it well. And so it's tough. And so, so you know, it's a slow process. Now, what's particularly frustrating is whether this is because of, you know, increased competition for grants or, or whatever else, the, the level of, of review, and I don't want to say scrutiny, because the scrutiny has always been there for good stuff. You know, scientists are very good at finding stuff that isn't good and, and being able to weed that out. So I don't think that's so much the issue. The issue is, is just sort of this pile-on effect that happens where you'll send a paper out and it'll take maybe a month or two, a month if you're lucky, two months more likely, to get anything back. But when it comes back, what usually happens is you get a few pages of, of comments from the various reviewers that they want you to address. And some are, you know, some are, you know, listen, I think you should, should change the way that you describe this because it's kind of overstating what you actually found. Um, some of it might be, you know what, there's one control experiment that if you did, it would make me feel a lot better. But then a lot of times what you get are these, what seem just sort of like, you know, kind of unrealistic demands to go back and sort of open up a whole new line of research, you know, <laughs> within the paper. And that's the part that drives people crazy because that takes months and you, and you have to stop what you were doing and go back and try to rescue this paper that you thought was finished. And, and so, you know, that's the part that, that's quite difficult. So whether or not, you know, what you're describing would solve that or not, I, I can't really say. At the end of the day, though, it's, it's like, you know, it's like anything. I mean, the, the customers, well, I guess we have to go. Okay, so that's our warning. So we'll wrap up. Um, I mean, the customer is going to dictate. The library closes at 9. Okay. So the customer is going to dictate that. So if these, if these types of journals go forward, and they're publishing good quality science, and the scientific community thinks they're publishing good quality science, then they might be successful. So a good example of that is, a, is I'm sure you guys are familiar with the PLOS journals that, are, that have come out. And so the PLOS journals are, they sort of take an attitude that they're not going to publish bad science, but they're not going to be quite, you know, that the entry for publication is not quite the same. So some journals, you know, journals are, they're, they're a business, and so they are interested in selling copies. And the way they sell copies is by, by featuring splashy articles. And so there is sort of a, a, an entryway to even get your papers considered at certain journals because it either has to be very splashy or you have to be splashy or something has to be there that, that makes them think they're going to sell journals with your paper beyond just whether it's good science or not. And the PLOS journals, because they're online journals mostly, I think, has taken the attitude that they're, you know, that's not necessarily going to be the case. Um, and, and again, at the end of the day, it's, it, it still goes through a peer review, so they're not accepting bad science, but they are going to publish more. They're not going to worry so much about whether or not this is going to, going to make the New York Times, right, when we publish this article. Um, and, and at the end of the day, the community of scientists kind of judge the article because articles get rated, they get downloaded, they get shared, and those types of metrics, you know, drive the success of papers. Um, so, you know, we'll see how, uh, so far they've been successful and we'll see if that continues to be a trend. I mean, there seem to be some more open access journals that are coming on where you might sit to see more of this model, but, but, but we'll have to see how, how the scientific community responds to it. But it's a counterpoint to that. PLOS had quite a bit of startup funding and had hunted a really good editorial team and managed yeah. to uh, convince a number of senior scientists to publish. To publish. So they were respect. That's a very good point. Like Sponte Pablo's Neanderthal DNA stuff. Came very out good point. So they, they did a lot to so establish the reputation. And that, and that goes to the point I was making. That at the end of the day, the scientific community is going to decide whether that they're going to read it and whether they're going to publish in it. And you're right. That went a long way to establishing the credibility in the community. Yeah. Uh, you tell me when to stop. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, <laughs> as soon as we wrap up, no, it's, it's, uh, it's the opposite question. How much time do I have to do something other than, than write grants? I mean, that's really the problem. And, and you know, um, we could go on for hours about this. I mean, this is the most important subject to most of us right now because it's, it's all we do these days are write grants. I mean, fun, the funding... So for the, for the um, I'll give you an example, for the National Cancer Institute where I send my grants, 
Um, at the beginning of the 2000s, if you, if you had a grant that scored in, say, the top 25% or so, you could feel pretty confident that it was going to get funded. And for new investigators, people that haven't really had uh, NIH grants before, you give them a little bit of a break. And so people that, that were in the top, say, 35% were getting grants um, um, back in the early 2000s. Um, nowadays, at the NCI, you have to be in the top 7 or 8% to even stand a chance. And even then, you are not guaranteed. So what that means, as you can imagine, is one, it's just any given grant is extremely difficult. But two, there's just this backlog. Uh, of, of grants that have built up. I mean, this is the problem is that, you know, around somewhere around 33%, you know, you can kind of tell what's really good and maybe what's not quite so good. And you can kind of make that cut. When you're down to single digits like this, that means there's excellent science that's just not getting funded. And it's impossible to make those decisions. And so we spend, we spend most of our time writing grants because we don't have as many as we used to and because there, it, it takes much longer to get one. I wish we could listen to you. Yeah, yeah. Oh.